Words appear. This documentary contains historical footage, and some of the language used does not reflect current values. This program has been open captioned and audio described. The independent living movement has deep roots in California and has grown into a model partnership seeking inclusion, self-control, and equal rights of persons with disabilities. This documentary covers the 30 years from the freedom marches and sit-ins of the 60s through the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. More importantly, it captures the history, pride, passion, and spirit of an ongoing civil rights philosophy developed of, by, and for persons with disabilities. The IL movement continues today to advocate for equity, accommodations, and equal access all over the world. Our history begins with civil clashes of the 1960s. Video title, A Passion for Freedom, The Birth of Independent Living. Black and white montage, marchers with a sign, we shall overcome, marchers with, we march with Selma, a mounted sign, restrooms for white and color, on a building, Rex Theater for colored people, policemen with nightsticks, Dr. King standing behind President Johnson, anti-war protesters, protesters facing rifles with bayonets. Four Berkeley students, two wheelchair users. These were guys who are right there in the epicenter of student activism at UC Berkeley. A sign, the Physically Disabled Students Program. Disability rights are civil rights. It's not inconvenient to have a barrier. It's exclusion to have a barrier. Newspaper headline, making war in a wheelchair. It really marked a major turning point in the history of disability rights activism. Protesters occupying a federal office. The concept of being self-directing is not going away. People with disabilities are just getting uppity. Protesters carrying signs outside the federal building. With one unified voice, the disabled of California said today, we have waited long enough. A sign. Support 504. Hello, I'm Robert David Hall. The 1960s and 70s were turbulent times in America. The struggle for civil rights of African Americans and women was at its peak. But there was another minority group fighting for its civil rights during that time. Protesters carrying signs outside the federal building. The largest minority group in America had been overlooked because of the group's oppressive history of being segregated from the rest of society many being housed in state-run institutions and nursing homes. Persons sleeping on cots in a hallway of an institution. Persons with disabilities organized, energized, and advocated for social change, striving for their inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the story of the independent living movement, based on the premise that all persons, even those with the most severe disabilities, have the right to live and work in the community and to have access to transportation and all other benefits of our society, just like their neighbors. The early years of the independent living and disability rights movements tell a story of perseverance and solidarity that is still being written. Man with white cane walks out of the federal building. Join us as we explore the continuing story of the independent living movement. On signs, be a friend to the disabled. Support IHSS. Words appear. A passion for freedom. The birth of independent living. A photo of a smiling family with a dark-haired young man lying on a bed. In 1962, a physically disabled young man named Ed Roberts convinced the University of California at Berkeley to admit him as a student. He became the first person with paralysis to attend the school. Newspaper headline, polio victim lives at Cowell, attends classes in wheelchair. The university housed him in the campus hospital, which was the only place large enough for his 800 pound iron lung. Two student wheelchair users. Soon he was joined on campus by five other students with similar conditions. They called themselves the rolling quads and began to organize and protest with others for disability rights. 
Executive Director, Berkeley Center for Independent Living. They also realized that it was critically important for people to come together and advocate for change. Jan Garrett. In groups, and that they could accomplish much more when they came as a group and were able to advocate for change. Two women and a man testify at a congressional hearing. Then each individual person could on their own. Ed with a breathing tube. The most important part of that is working with other people. You need away from your own problems to help somebody else. And that liberated me. When I realized I could help others, it made me a lot freer to help myself. A student chair user under the Sather Gate on campus. Being able to mingle freely on campus with young people their own age empowered Roberts and his peers to challenge long-held notions about the place of people with disabilities in our society and motivated them to seek change. Paul Longmore, professor of history, San Francisco State University. These are people who were in or had recently graduated from college or university and influenced by the uh, African-American civil rights movement. Civil rights protesters holding signs. The women's movement and the anti-war movements, uh, participating sometimes in those movements, they began to apply the political analyses of particularly the civil rights and women's movements to their own situations. A headline, Disabled Citizens Demand Rights. Dr. Katherine Campisi, former director of California Department of Rehabilitation. It, because it was the 60s, we, you know, there was a lot of civil rights activity, and you know, we began to talk about you know, well, how was our situation really that different. It wasn't that disability made us less, but it was defined as making us less. Sign on a building, UC Berkeley Disabled Students Program. Roberts and his partners organized Berkeley's first disabled students program. They spearheaded the drive for such basic accommodations as curb cuts on campus and in Berkeley. U.S. Department of Education, former Assistant Secretary. I think one of the differences between the Berkeley Disabled Students Program Judy Human. was the fact that it had a very strong advocacy perspective. So it did wheelchair repair. It did uh, personal assistance services referral. It helped people in finding places to live. But it also did a lot of advocacy around benefits counseling. Help people learn about if they were eligible for SSI and if they were eligible for a program in California called in-home supportive services, which was personal assistance services. Four students sitting in a living room. As several of the young activists neared graduation, they realized the need for similar independent living services in the community. They wanted to change funding and policies so that more people could take charge of their own lives. Their most daunting challenge was getting others to view them differently. A clerk holds up a receipt for a male chair user. That we didn't want to live in an institution. One, I remember one dean at the university said, oh, you'll finish your Ph.D., and then you'll live in a nursing home. And I said, no, that's not the plan. We're here to change that whole idea. So, simultaneously almost, in Berkeley, California, Houston, Texas, and Boston, Massachusetts, groups of these young adults came together and tried to develop the means to make it possible for them to get personal assistance services, Man adjusts another man's wheelchair. Accessible and affordable housing. Chair user in her kitchen. Access in the community. Woman in van with assistive technology. So that they could live the kinds of lives they wanted. And the first independent living centers came into existence as a result of that. In 1972, with funding from a federal grant, the Berkeley Center for Independent Living came into existence. Sign on a building, Center for Independent Living. The center's core values of peer support, consumer control, civil rights, inclusion, equal access and advocacy remain the central focus of the independent living movement. The first federal grant that funded the Center for Independent Living, and that was from the Department of Education and it was $50,000. We also received very early funding from the San Francisco Foundation, um, Clorox Corporation, and also proceeds from poker games um, that were happening uh, at various people's apartments. 
We also have a number of individual donors who really believed in the concept of independent living and community-based living and personal choice for people with disabilities. Jerry Brown with Ed Roberts. In 1975, California Governor Jerry Brown appointed Ed Roberts as director of the California Department of Rehabilitation, the same agency that had once labeled him too severely disabled to ever work. Roberts used his influence to expand the independent living center concept in California. June Kales, policy consultant. It was the early 70s out here in California and... Uh, Western University of Health Science. And in the mid-70s, some friends contacted me and said, we want to do something like they're doing in Berkeley. People inside the Berkeley Center signing to each other. In Southern California with uh, people with disabilities uh, offering services so folks could get what they need, do what they want to do, go where they want to go, and not have to be confined or warehoused in an institution. A second grant application. I think it was innovation and expansion money that came from the feds to California to the Berman Rehab and then Rehab um, issued an RP and we applied and Ed Roberts at the time was director of uh, Rehab and uh, Robert speaking with three DOR staff members. Was warned not to use the money for that I believe but he said, are you out of your mind? Of course I'm using the money for that. You certainly had the use of this innovation and expansion grant money that was being used in California, Michigan, and Massachusetts. That wasn't a separate piece of le legislation, but it was a milestone in as much as three state directors agreed, even though some people were screaming you couldn't do it, to use rehab dollars to help set up programs. The LA County Office of Affirmative Action. In the early days, Gordon Anthony, uh, senior deputy. There was a huge struggle because we didn't have anything. There was no access that existed. Uh, people with disabilities were basically not even considered by politicians or government programs. We were very much ostracized. Inside the Berkeley Center, Hale Zukas moves his wheelchair with his head pointer. It was we in the independent living centers that started. Um, when they first got going, they were sort of like Camelot, if you will. It was a, a special time where everybody, we were joined together because uh, we, we didn't, we weren't a part of society, but in those centers, we were all equal. We all had an opportunity to work with each other. The feeling that existed uh, gave us strength. Gerald Baptiste, Associate Director. My intent was to be here for six months. Berkeley uh, CIA. And to do outreach specifically to the minority communities, making them aware of what resources that was available. IL at that time was very busy, and I realized uh, that there was a larger need. This really clued me in as to a population uh, that was on the move, that was moving in the same track that the Civil Rights Movement happened back in the 50s and 60s, and that there was a lot of work to do be done. Protesters sit on the ground in front of San Francisco City Hall. Kathy Yule, former executive director, San Francisco ILRC. Most centers uh, that grew also grew by bringing funds in from their local communities, whether it was government money or private money. Um, some of them did fee for services. Tom Bates in Berkeley, the assemblyman, he authored our first bill that funded independent living centers. Um, I think the biggest thing for us was that we were a cross-disability movement, um, and that was real different in those days. Um, everybody else was a single disability agency. Also, CIL in the early years was very instrumental in helping other centers get started, not only in California, but in other parts of the country as well. Chair user working and wearing a headset. People at that time that was coming from all over the country and coming here, and we had a technical assistance project that's set up to assist people in just how you go back to your own hometowns and states and, and countries. Chinese delegation and Berkeley CIL staff. And establish an independent living center with the same philosophy and uh, the same mission that this center had. Burns Vic, policy uh, consultant. I'm, I'm very supportive. I think that uh, having community-based nonprofit organizations as a focal point for 
different communities on a regional basis. Latina counselor providing IL services. Uh, to help provide folk with whatever they need to be independent. And it's critical to remember that the independent living movement is based on helping people find accessible, affordable housing where they want to live. Man with guide dog walks towards his apartment. And be independent, that's absolutely critical. Photographer with disability at a photo shoot. The central operative word for this whole movement is access. Danica Dalimore, coordinator. And planning as an agency, as an independent living center, to really Central um, Coast CIM. think about change as a systems kind of a process. Over a long haul, what can we do to improve our rights um, as a group? And we have a responsibility to continue to change uh, our movement as things change in our society. Activists testify at the California State Capitol. There was a recognition that there needed to be a national organization that could not only um, help all of the existing centers work more effectively together. Sign says NCIL, National Council on Independent Living. But also to be able to um, advocate for uh, the need for more funding for more centers, but then to also become more of a, a voice for the grassroots movement. Uh, one of the early objectives was to have disabled people work at the center. People working at desks inside the Berkeley CIL. And get experience with organization and administration so that eventually they could move out from there and become the administrators and executives of other disability related organizations and agencies so that eventually activists with disabilities could take over all the programs and organizations and institutions that impacted people with disabilities. Jan Garrett moves to a colleague in a cubicle. One of the most exciting things about the independent living philosophy is this idea of consumer control um, and consumer leadership. Independent living is a psychological idea much more than a physical concept. Let my head down a little bit more. I'm paralyzed from the neck down, but I'm completely in control of my own life. A man pushes Ed up a van ramp. I make decisions about what I want. And when you begin to believe that, it's very empowering and powerful. And then it becomes, it's, it's almost... Uh, a woman with a guide dog crosses the street. When it catches on with other people, they see, well, if he can do that, why can't I? The creation of the independent living centers was a critical first step in the independent living movement. But the struggle for freedom for persons with disabilities was about to get militant. Words appear. Enforce the law. A photo of President Johnson pin in hand. In 1964, President Lyndon Johnson signed the historic Civil Rights Act. This legislation prohibited discrimination based on race, color, religion, and gender primarily the result of the African-American Civil Rights Movement. Dr. King with other activists marched towards Selma. The law was amended in 1968 to protect all Americans, including people with disabilities and women. A decade later, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was passed by Congress. Contained in the legislation is a regulation called Section 504, which became the first major law to bar discrimination against people with disabilities in federally funded programs and agencies. The regulations would force hospitals, universities, and any place receiving federal money to remove obstacles to services and provide access to public transportation and public places. Chair user enters a public building. However, unlike the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act was never implemented. In 1977, in response to federal indifference to disability rights, political demonstrations erupted nationwide. A sign 504 button, a sign with a raised fist inside the wheelchair symbol. Some of the demonstrators occupied an area outside the office of HEW Secretary Joseph Califano. I will sign a set of 504 regulations by early May. Now I will do it now. A sign, our biggest handicap is Califano. 
A handicap demand that Section 504 of the Civil Rights Act be signed. It was passed by Congress in 1974. It guarantees the rights of the handicapped in education and employment. President Ford inside the Oval Office. The Ford administration never implemented the act. And now the new HEW secretary, Joseph Califano, says he will sign it in May. The handicapped want him to sign it now. A headline, handicapped, still wait. With the real threat of being denied federal funding, Americans with disabilities thought that agencies and institutions finally had to pay attention to issues of discrimination and barriers. Wheelchairs stuck at a curb. But compliance was expensive, and the government did not enforce compliance. People were getting very frustrated. Wheelchair user unable to use witness box. When President Jimmy Carter's administration took office in January 1977, the Health Education and Welfare Department began revising and watering down the regulations for the Rehabilitation Act with no input from the disability community. On April 5, 1977, groups of protesters with disabilities occupied government buildings in sit-ins across the country. Chair users move through a hallway. Headline, Disabled Lead New Civil Rights Movement. Well, Isabel, what's going on now is an overnight sit-in. Actually, the demonstration is going on throughout the entire nation, Washington, New York, Denver, here in San Francisco. Protesters gather outside the federal building. It all started this morning here at the old federal building on 50 Fulton when an incident took place outside. Immediately after that demonstration this morning, the handicapped started invading the building. It's the old federal building, which is now the HEW headquarters. They spent most of the day in the office of the regional director here. A group marches outside. Many carry placards. Others sit in an office. Protesters carry in boxes of clothing and food. And I've just gotten word to that these people are now locked into the building. At 6 o'clock, this building did close down. However, about a half hour ago, they came up with an agreement. None of these people are going to be arrested or moved out of this building. Some members of the HEW staff will be remaining here with them throughout the night. Those people who are here right now will be locked in. If they want to leave, it's all right, but they can't come back in. People crawl up the steps of the U.S. Capitol building. The protesters in New York, Denver, and Washington, D.C. went home after a few days. But in San Francisco, at the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, protesters refused to leave. Newspaper headline, 130 handicapped vow to maintain each EW sit-in here. It marked a, a visible, powerful, cross-disability alliance. There are people with all sorts of disabilities banded together, sitting in, occupying that federal building for those three and a half weeks. That was really unprecedented. Holland DeLille, disability policy and consultant. Judy would say, Judy Hammond would say, can you stay one more day? Just stay one more day. So the commitment would be made day by day, every day. You'd say, okay, I'll stay one more day. A woman deals cards. There are people that want to stay here until, and there is a significant number of those people. Quite frankly, I think it's going to be very difficult for them to put a lot of pressure on us. When we asked them questions yesterday about 504, and we said to them, have you ever read 504? Every one of the people that we had in that office said no. I mean, I think that they should thank us for being here and welcome the opportunity that finally they're going to get educated about the law that they're supposed to be enforcing. A group in the HEW building, a group outside the SF City Hall. That sit-in marked the first time they saw in the news media politicized disability rights activists. Always before disability had been presented to them as a medical problem that resulted in social limitations. Now they heard, in an unvarnished way, a political message about disability as a kind of minority status, disability rights as a civil rights issue. Ed near a sign, civil rights for disabled. One thing, it's the first really militant thing that disabled people 
have ever done. And we feel like we're building a real social movement. And we want people to listen to us. We have tried negotiations. They do not work. And at this point, we are non-negotiable. We want those regulations signed. Chair users move through a hallway. Every day was a challenge to stay there. Every day, people, I mean, people had left their lives. They had left school, they had left work. They had, they had totally interrupted their lives to be there. Holland shakes her head. <laughs> it was just a real personal sacrifice on the part of many people to be there and, and, and change history and change attitudes and change the place in society for people with disabilities. Protesters sleep on the floor. It is nearing two weeks now since 150 handicapped people moved into the HEW offices. And it was today, in response to that occupation, that a special congressional hearing convened. A younger Judy Human. Whether there was a sec section 504, whether there was a PL 94142, there was a Brown versus Board of Education. The harassment, the um, lack of equity that has been provided for disabled individuals and that now is even being discussed by the administration is so intolerable that I can't quite put it into words. I can tell you that every time you raise issues of separate but equal, the outrage of disabled individuals across this country is going to continue, it is going to be ignited. There will be more takeovers of buildings until finally maybe you begin to understand our position. We will no longer allow the government to up oppress disabled individuals. We want the law enforced. We want no more segregation. We will accept no more discussion of segregation. And I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. Judy covers her face with her hands. Michael Collins, Executive Director, National Council on Disability. So they were willing to go in and sacrifice many weeks of their lives and live in substandard conditions. Under a blanket, protesters sleeping on a stairway. Without beds without uh, showers, and yet uh, make a point that won't be forgotten ever. If they hadn't been living independently, if they'd been institutionalized, would not have been able to take that big step. So um, that's what we devoted ourselves to in the, in the independent living movement, is to change society's meaning of what it means to be a person with a disability, and that includes um, making it so that the supports that we expect um, in our communities about other characteristics happen naturally for us as people with disabilities. Two men push another up a ramp. In the third week of the strike, 14 of the demonstrators traveled to Washington, D.C. Protester rally in front of the White House. To take their protest directly to President Carter and HEW Secretary Joseph Califano, Califano canceled a meeting with the group, and when they tried to force a new meeting, police blocked the entrance to the HEW building. Protests continued, and ultimately, the historic demonstrations were successful, and the 504 regulations were signed. On May 4, 1977, the regulations were finally issued. A woman shakes a raised fist. 35 million Americans, handicapped Americans, won a big victory today. When HEW Secretary Joseph Califano signed a paper today, the implementation of the law began. A small child in the lap of a smiling chair user. The occupation of the federal building in San Francisco demonstrated the power of persons with disabilities as a social class. It was a social class who needed their civil rights protected from discrimination by societal and governmental attitudes towards disabilities. With the independent living centers spreading throughout the country,
this newly recognized cross-disability minority group was gaining political power state by state and soon would be pushing for a national policy of inclusion and access to the American dream of freedom and independence. Words appear toward independence. A group holding candles outside the U.S. Supreme Court building, Justin Dart is speaking. Distinguished members of the court, we respectfully demand justice. We are Americans. We have a God-given right to choose where and how we will live. A man wearing a cowboy hat with black framed glasses perched on his narrow nose. Justin Dart was an unlikely hero of the independent living and disability rights movements. Children lay on hospital beds, nurses by their side. In 1948, at the age of 18, Dart contracted polio and was told he had three days to live. Having survived this experience, he graduated from college in 1954 and became a very successful and wealthy business person women working inside a factory, who actively hired women and persons with disabilities. In 1966, Dart went to South Vietnam to witness rehabilitation services provided to civilians. What he saw would change his life forever. A village with people walking down a dirt road. And I got down there and saw these uh, little kids starving to death, laying on a concrete floor in their feces and with flies all over them in the so-called institution, you know, uh, and... Uh, Four young boys, all with distended stomachs. And, and here I was with my professional photographer, taking photo ops with these dying kids, and all of a sudden came on me, Justin, this is evil and you're the lead, playing the leading role in it. And I decided that, uh, that I couldn't live with myself unless I got in this, uh, in this movement. Dart sold his businesses, and with his wife Yoshiko, devoted their lives to furthering human rights. Dart worked tirelessly with various state and federal disability commissions. In 1986, as a member of the National Council on Disability, Dart presented Vice President George Bush with the report Towards Independence. Vice President Bush and President Reagan in the Oval Office. The report was an assessment of federal laws and programs affecting people with disabilities. This would become the first draft of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In 1988, Dart was appointed to chair the Congressional Task Force on the Rights and Empowerments of Americans with Disabilities. He and his wife Yoshiko used their own money to organize hearings around the United States. They gathered testimony from a host of individuals with disabilities, recounting their experiences of discrimination. A full hearing room. And, and this enormous wealth of testimony was then used to present to Congress. Persons testify before a congressional committee in Washington, D.C. To verify to it the need for a civil rights law that covered all of American society. That law, of course, was the Americans with Disabilities Act. At the White House, George Bush sits with Justin Dart nearby. Justin and other dedicated disability leaders and activists were on the stage when President George Herbert Walker Bush signed the ADA into law. Bush hands Dart a pen. And today's legislation brings us closer to that day when no Americans will ever again be deprived of their basic guarantee of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I had never heard a presidential candidate or a president uh, say that people with disabilities ought to have civil rights. I think if it hadn't been for his constant, courageous uh, leadership and insistence, that the law would not have uh, passed. And then Justin Dart, this very dedicated man, after the passage of the ADA, went back again 
to all of the states to inform and educate uh, his fellow members of the disability communities about what this law exactly could and would do and how they could uh, see to its enforcement in their local communities and in their, in their lives. Tony Coelho, former U.S. representative, author of the ADA. Uh, it has had a tremendous impact all through the country. Uh, but more importantly, what people don't realize is that we have now approximately 20 countries throughout the world who have adopted the ADA. Uh, recently, there's a, a resolution in the United Nations creating disability rights worldwide and hopefully many other many countries who have never given this a thought will be adopting that in the near future. President Clinton leans forward shaking Dart's hands. Dart received the Medal of Freedom Award from President Clinton in 1998. Dart accepted the award for the thousands of grassroots patriots who had made many sacrifices for change. However, the struggle for independence is far from over. Dart in front of an American flag with a flyer. You have the power. Out of this movement has been growing alternative perspectives on life, on community. Woman waves a sign with the word independence. On the nature of American democracy, on the meaning of pluralism, on what we mean when we talk about equality, of what we're aiming for in building a diverse democratic society. People carry a yellow banner, community living, worth fighting for. The disability rights movement raises important questions about all of those fundamental American concepts. It challenges traditional notions of community and humanness and equality. It makes us rethink those things and it forces us to develop them in new ways that are appropriate to a society that will include people with disabilities as contributing members of the community who have a great deal to offer. That's been overlooked. That needs to be attended to. That's the future of the disability rights movement. A woman store clerk assists a woman chair user. As society has grown to expect the presence of people with disabilities in every aspect or venue of our daily lives. Four activists talk in the hall of the federal building. It's important to remember the contributions of those early leaders whose lives were far different than we enjoy today. Many of the people responsible for these changes had roots in the independent living network from that single office in Berkeley that was established by Ed Roberts and his peers. Today, there are more than 60 independent living office sites in California and over 500 similar offices providing independent living services in every state and territory. The movement has spread to countries around the world thanks to the great example set by Roberts and the thousands of others who've worked to create opportunities for independence for millions of people with all types of disabilities during the past three decades. Large group of protesters moved down a street. Independent living seemed like a simple idea in 1972. Create an organization managed and operated by people with disabilities to serve similar individuals in a manner that respects personal choice and enhances their ability to live independently throughout their lives. That philosophy still works today. I'm Robert David Hall. Thank you for watching. Words appear. The end. Video credits listing many who contributed. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Governor, State of California. Kim Belche, Secretary of California Health and Human Services. Tony Sauer, Director, California Department of Rehabilitation. Elizabeth Pazdral, Executive Director, California State Independent Living Council. State Independent Living Council Video Steering Committee members. Neil Albritton, Dwight Bateman, Michael Collins, Wayne Cook, Richard DeVilder, Jan Garrett, Finn Harville, Erica Jones, Kent Mickelson, Christina Mills, Loretta Moore, Elsa Quezada, Olivia Raynor, Norma Vescovo, David W. Wilder, Hope Yasui. Historical photographs and footage provided by ADAPT, American Disabled for Attendant Programs Today, buyoutfootage.com, California Department of Aging, 
California Department of Developmental Services, California Economic Development Department, California Department of Rehabilitation, CBS Television, 60 Minutes, Chico State University, Dredef, Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, HistoricalDocuments.com, Holland DeLille, Independent Living Research Utilization and the Institute for Rehabilitation and Research, Houston, Texas, March of Dimes, Photohome.com, the Bancroft Museum, the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library, the James E. Carter Presidential Library, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library, the Library of Congress, the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library, the Municipal Channel, Houston, Texas, the National Council on Disability, the National Council on Independent Living, the National Library of Medicine, the United Nations, the United States Department of Justice, the Western New York Independent Living Project, and the Center for Independent Living Management, Buffalo, New York, the 20th Anniversary Celebration and Commemoration Committee, Tom Olin, Treehouse Video, LLC, WNET-TV, New York, Zona Roberts, Producer, Editor, Michael Rowe, Writers, Christian Berg, Michael Collins, Description written by Terry Grossman, Narrators, Robert David Hall, Kitty O'Neill, Videographers, Robert Gardner, Fred Harbett, Michael Rowe, Scott Sebaser, Justin Wilhelm, Production Associates, Tony Adias, Lisa Kanetz, Frank Krug, Carl Liggins, Christine Piper, Jim Rowe, Justin Wilhelm, Narrator Location Provided by Julie Madorsky, MD, Music License by Killer Tracks, Network Music. Funding was provided by the United States Department of Education, Rehabilitation Services Administration. Produced for the California State Independent Living Council by the California Secretary of State Communications Center. All rights reserved 2009.